my God. <laughs> Sir. Patton's on the floor. He's covered in blood. He tells them to check his hands, and basically they realize quickly that Patton is paralyzed. From the Battle of the Bulge to Patton's untimely death, his legend continued to grow. Join me as I review two movies that provide valuable insight into the last days of General Patton. Finally, we will explore the question, what if Patton had not died at the end of the war? Our immediate concern is that von Rundstedt has the 101st Airborne trapped here. There's this place called Bastogne, and it's located at a strategic crossroads. Ike places the 10th Airborne, the 101st, and the 82nd there, and they find themselves cut off and surrounded. The temperature is dropping down to 30 and 40 below. You have men who are getting frostbite. You have men who can't fire their rifles because their rifles are frozen, and yet they're being asked to fight. And you have this small group of Americans holding out. They're surrounded, right, by the Germans. Ike asked Patton to turn his men around and head towards Bastogne. And Patton says, I can attack with three divisions in 48 hours. And Patton knows if he's to advance with the Third Army, the weather must clear so he can get necessary air cover, right? Because he works in tandem with that air cover. And those men that are fighting there, they're running out of food, they're running out of ammunition, they need supplies from the air too. And so Patton calls the head chaplain, James H. O'Neill, he's a Catholic priest. I want a prayer, a weather prayer. A weather prayer, sir? He's a Catholic priest and he's looking to see are there any prayers for ending rain and snow, right? And he doesn't find anything. He goes through all the prayer books, so he decides he's just gonna write his own prayer. Here's the prayer. It's a very famous prayer. It says, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have had to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power, we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies. And establish thy justice among men and nations. Only one day after the Third Army and Patton call upon God to cease the rains and the snow, all of a sudden the sun is out and it's gonna remain clear for six days. And this is gonna allow Patton and the Allies to basically stem the German counterattack and win the Battle of the Bulge. Get me that chaplain. He stands in good with the Lord, and I want to decorate him. Patton's going to move about 100,000 men, tanks, and jeeps, and supplies and equipment over mud, ice, and snow. And he's going to relieve Bastogne in just seven days. And logistically, it's amazing. Unlike General Montgomery, who historians likened his movements to the majestic deliberation of a pachyderm. In other words, he's as slow as an elephant. Patton knew how to move his men and supplies with urgency. Now, at the end of this scene, you see uh, the German map of the bulge burns up, and it's very symbolic of how critical the victory at the Battle of the Bulge is to America winning the war. In 10 days, we could be in Berlin. What about the fortifications that were done in Metz? Fixed fortifications, sir monuments to the stupidity of man. In war, he said the only sure defense is offense, and the efficiency of offense depends on the warlike souls of those who conduct it. In other words, it depends on the leader, and you better have an aggressive leader. Now, interestingly, Hitler believes democracies produce weak people, and that they're easy to beat. Uh, when Hitler is starting to take over countries in Europe, FDR basically sends a note to Hitler and says, stop picking on the weak nations. And Hitler responds, don't worry, we won't attack you. And there are those who believe that even within our democracy, that sometimes democracies turn out weak, soft people. Just kind of like ancient Athens, which of course Patton would have been an expert on, produced softer people in some of the Greek wars, but then they would have these Greek warriors who would rise up and lead them to victory. Patton saw himself as out. You need a Patton to do the dirty, hard things of war. Because here's something most Americans don't think about. Democracies are all about, you know, compromise and, and so forth and civility. War isn't that way. It's horrific. And you need a Patton. You need a hard driving, tough guy that's willing to do something that we don't even like to say the word. He's willing to kill other human beings. And he's willing to get his men to kill other human beings. And that's not an easy thing to do. And there's an interesting belief that as fewer and fewer people have grown up on the farm, right? You shot the deer and you cut it up or you slaughtered the cow and you cut it up and you saw death. And now we have 
generations that have really since World War II, and they don't have a concept of death. And then all of a sudden you throw them on the battlefield and they see human beings dismembered. It's no wonder they have horrific psychological responses. That's the first time they've ever seen that. And so all that to say you need a Patton who can convince these softer men to be hard soldiers and fight hard. Good God, look at that. Where you going, General? Berlin. I'm going to personally shoot that paper hanging son of a bitch. Patton is coming along the road along with General Eisenhower and General Bradley. And this kid, right, his name's Frank Sasan. Patton looks over at him and he smiles at him. And Sasan says, I I've remembered that the rest of my life. I, I think we need to have that understanding that, yes, there were times the men were angry at Patton. There's also this great pride in having served under Patton. My grandfather shared because uh, he served in North Africa and Sicily and so forth, that that was a great moment for him when he got to listen to Patton speak to his outfit. And so there's just kind of this, wow, this is Patton, right? We've been told about these wonder weapons the Germans were working on. Long-range rockets, push-button bombing, weapons that don't need soldiers. Wonder weapons. Thank God I don't see the wonder in them. Killing without heroics, nothing is glorified, nothing is reaffirmed. No heroes, no cowards, no troops, no generals. Patton's a warrior, right? And kind of like all humans, uh, what I have seen is what tends to be our strength often proves to be our weakness. So for instance, have, have you ever known someone that's a perfectionist? And, and those kind of people sometimes, they're hypercritical of themselves. And maybe you've noticed this, they're kind of hypercritical of other people. But I'm gonna tell you this, if I'm gonna go have an operation, guess what kind of person I want? I want a perfectionist. So even with all their flaws. So again, we're talking about Patton. Hyper aggressive, but he has some flaws. Uh, another example, King David, right? Here's a man, the scripture says he is passionate in his love for God. But what we see is when he's not passionate in his love for God, his passion goes to a dark side and it leads him down a very destructive road of adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba and it, it almost destroys his kingdom. Yes, Patton is brusque and yes, sometimes he says things where you're like, why didn't you keep your mouth closed? But that same aggressiveness, when it's on the combat field, it makes him brilliant and it saves lots of lives. And so he's a package like most people. Well, the war shouldn't be over and we should stop pussyfooting about the Russians. We're gonna to have to fight them sooner or later anyway. Why not do it now when we got the army here to do it with? Instead of disarming these German troops, we ought to get them to help us fight the Bolsheviks. He is talking about, we need to go fight the Russians. They're the enemy now and they're still our allies, right? He's assigned to the 15th army and he grouses that it's, he's been turned into a paper shuffler. They've basically shut Patton down and probably for good cause. I don't know anything about politics, you know that. I have no political ambitions after the war. All I want to do is to command an army in combat. When he was back home in Boston, he had compared the Nazi party to the Republican and Democrat parties. And you can imagine that doesn't go over well in America. So needless to say, Eisenhower is kind of like, how do we move Patton aside? Patton's great on the battlefield, but politically he has zero sense. All good things must come to an end. And the best thing that's happened to me, the honor and uh, privilege of commanding the Third Army. And then he begins to make these kind of statements that are a little startling. In his diary, he says, sometimes I feel that I may be nearing the end of this life. Not exactly the fire that we normally see in Patton. Patton is really dejected now, and he tells his buddy, uh, General Hober Gay, and they decide to go on a hunting trip together. They get in a Cadillac, and you see in, in, in the movie, they're in this nice Cadillac. They're gonna be followed by a military truck, and the military truck's actually gonna cat, uh, carry Patton's hunting dog. And as they're driving along, uh, they see some runes. Of course, this is Patton, who's really into ancient history and so forth, so they've got to stop. But it's cold and it's rainy. When he gets back in the limo, he actually sits in the front of the limo to kind of dry off his, his, his feet. And they start driving, and as Patton looks back, because he's cold, 
he starts thinking about his hunting dog. Now, I guess if you don't have a hunting dog, maybe you don't kind of understand how some men look at their dogs, but he starts thinking, my dog must be freezing. So he orders the driver to stop. Bring Engelbert up here, put him in the front seat. One thing will freeze to death in that truck. And so they start driving again. And as they drive, they come to this railroad crossing. Patton is going to be slammed forward. And you can see in the scene, it's not like at this big crash, but the power even of this small crash without a seatbelt is devastating. Oh my God. Sir, you're hurt. Patton's on the floor. He's covered in blood. He tells them to check his hands and, and, and basically they realize quickly that Patton is paralyzed. What is it, General? I was just thinking. Hell of a way to start a vacation. So they take him to a hospital. He's basically crushed a couple of vertebrae and broken his neck. And they're gonna put bolts in him and try to give him tension and hold him straight. Because he's laying still, he gets blood clots. And about 12 days later, Patton is dead. The French immediately offer to have Patton buried in Napoleon's tomb, along with these other great field marshals of French history, right? His wife wants to bring him home, but then she decides that would be selfish because she doesn't own Patton, is how she kind of looks at it, his men do. And so he's gonna be buried in Europe and he's gonna be buried amongst a lot of the men who died at the Battle of the Bulge. He does it where his cross is facing all the other men. There are a bunch of chaplains that gather to pray at his burial, and along with the chaplains are some rabbis, and they're wearing their concentration camp uniforms, and they pray for Patton too. Some people ask, why would these rabbis be praying for him? After all, Patton was, what one might say, anti-Semitic, so why would they pray for him? And, and, and the rabbis responded, because he's a hero to us, basically. Because of him, the war ended sooner, and thousands of people were liberated from these death camps, and that deserves honor. Roman conquerors returning from the wars enjoyed the honor of a triumph, a tumultuous parade. A slave stood behind the conqueror, holding a golden crown and whispering in his ear a warning that all glory is fleeting. Had Patton lived, uh, he had no foreseeable political future right ahead of him, uh, unlike Eisenhower Wright, who goes on to become president. And one can only imagine he would have struggled, kind of like Douglas MacArthur, his twin, but in the Pacific, if you will. Douglas MacArthur, when he was basically fired during the Korean War, he famously said, old soldiers never die, they just kind of fade away. One has to wonder if Patton would have just faded away. Whatever the case, Patton remains one of the most successful generals, as well as one of the most controversial generals World War II produced.